What's up everybody? Welcome to Inside the Game, your source for everything in the world of video games. We've got another hot episode this week. What do we have? Here it is. It's the rundown. Kind of tell you about how we feel. There's a couple of aspects of this game that are, well, interesting to get into. First of all, this is a... Um... But for now, I would like to give you my top five personal tips for Horizon Forbidden West. Guys, it's fair to say we've been gaming for a very long time, and over that time, there's been some games that have been cancelled. Instead of just waking up a little bit too late, as we have in the past, this has a, a whole lot of science fiction going on about the world. You are the only human to fall straight out of that hole in space. Time. Challenges for hunting down legendary enemies. And even outside of that, it's really exciting to find a one to three star legendary and hope to get that legendary piece of gear that you've been working for. Steve, we have the latest Gran Turismo 7 on our PlayStation 5s right now, and we're hitting the racetrack once again. Looks like another great show, so let's get started with Scott and Corey as they get caught in the crossfire. We're on the Xbox Series X and don't get caught in the crossfire. I've seen your future. Global risk is get off the weapon. You will become Corey, we're taking a look at Crossfire X, and this is on the Xbox, but it kind of came out, I think, at the beginning of this month, but yeah. regardless, we're here to take a little look and, well, kind of tell you about how we feel. There's a couple of aspects of this game that are, well, interesting to get into. First of all, this is a sort of a, a Counter-Strike similar game. Uh, it's yeah. very big in the Asian market, so it's not something that you may have seen before. But this is kind of their breakthrough into the West, and well, it it's interesting. But uh, I'm gonna throw it to you. How do you feel about this one so far? Well, we got you know kind of the option to be able to pick this one up on Game Pass, so that was kind of nice. And we're actually checking out the single player campaign. One of the two that are available, only one's available on Game Pass. You actually have to pay for the other one in a pack that costs thirty dollars. That encompasses both single player campaigns and the multiplayer as well. Um, like you said, the multiplayer has been out for a month or so on Game Pass, and it also has been over in the Asian market for quite a while. It has a huge player base, and if you even jump into the multiplayer, you realize fairly quickly that there are a lot of very very experienced players there but today's review is actually focusing on this single player campaign project catalyst and honestly man jumping into this visually i thought it looked pretty good uh you know it kind of gave me these you know call of duty advanced warfare vibes like this is kind of the the environment we're in um and honestly it's a little linear uh as you kind of make it through this one we get a to kind of follow a squad of uh, three soldiers and you know honestly they are somewhat forgettable there isn't anything you know to stand out yeah. about them um but the idea is, is that we kind of play in the perspective of all three of them throughout the course of the campaign and we kind of you know see the the war through their eyes and that was kind of one of the cooler mechanics that kind of pointed out to me at first was when you do switch between the characters in some of the levels um we'll kind of get into it a little bit later but there is a kind of a sniper point where you are protecting yourself you know you were playing as one guy <laughs> he gets captured and now you switch over to the sniper and you're taking out the guys around the building to you know be able to let that guy escape and Honestly, that was one of the more standout things for me, and that was fairly early on. Um, Project Catalyst only lasts about three hours, so you're not going to be in it for a ton of time here. Yeah. Um, but honestly, Scott, it was just a little lackluster for me. It was, like I said, very linear. You are just kind of going from you know area to area, clearing the enemies, picking up ammo and things along the way, but just nothing here was like too standout. What did you think? Yeah, I, I hear a lot of that. It's a very similar experience that I had, but I find that the cutscenes, the kind of, well, movie-style aesthetic of it is probably the standout. Yeah. You get a lot of this action in these cutscenes that happens relatively quickly and often, and it looks really good, whether it's mm. just explosions going off or different characters coming in. But, it, well, you said something that I agree with. These characters are just quite forgettable. Yeah. I remember the sniper guy, and I remember the guy the sniper guy is covering, but other than that, it's not really... <laughs> 
that important, but no. that kind of uncovers the bigger issue at work here, which is I don't know why I'm in this game. I don't know what the war is. I don't know what the motivation is. There's just, there's bad guy and we have to stop him. And I, I guess that kind of is satisfactory, but the story wasn't drawing me in or anything like that. No. It was the cutscenes that kind of remind me that, oh yeah, okay, there is a purpose for this. But, you know, like you said, you kind of crawl through these different areas and there's not much of an option as to how to play. No. Sometimes you can go quiet and other times you can just go in guns blazing, but that's <laughs> about the only choice you get and that was kind of flat. But yeah. when it comes down to the gunplay, there's really nothing wrong with it at all. Um, I, I don't think it stands out in any sort of aspect. You're not really piloting these great machines or anything like that. There's no break from the normal first-person shooter. So it just kind of became a little bit flat. But it does last for about three hours. I think I beat this game in one sitting. On yeah, hard. I think most people that are going to jump into this are going to beat it fairly quickly, whether it's one or two sittings. Like, you know, three hours doesn't take that long. And you do move you through this fairly quickly, but honestly, there just aren't any real, like, major mechanics here at play. Like you said, this is a basic shooter. It feels fairly arcadey. The computer AI, regardless if you're playing on easy, regular, or hard, is it overly hard? And then with this added bullet time mechanic that they have, it makes things even easier uh, as far as hitting the targets. And this thing regenerates almost, I'd say like 10, 15 seconds. So you can keep kind of using it and spamming it. And it just does make the overall easy experience even easier. And that takes away from, you know, that feeling of accomplishment at the end of it all. You just kind of are like, well, my time with this one may be done. Um, there were some audio glitches I had, but overall, like you said, the visuals were probably the standout here. It's the one thing that I kind of can go back to and say, you know what, they did a good job. It looked polished, it looked good, the cutscenes were done well, but everything else, man, it was just kind of a snooze fest. We gotta get Steiner. <laughs> Ain't no we. You're not in any shape, I'll get Steiner. So that was our pretty short time with Crossfire X. Uh, I have to say, it wasn't a bad time at all. It, it certainly did the job. It was a decent shooter, but it just doesn't accelerate in any one category. Uh, it looks pretty nice, but that's not enough to sell me on a game nowadays when you look at the market around it and you think, well, I wish this had something that kind of set it apart. I, I have a lot of fun on the multiplayer. I just want to shout that out. The multiplayer is probably the better part of this package but <laughs> yeah it just didn't do a whole lot for me i i wish the gunplay was a little bit more varied um i kind of feel like i'm holding either a paintball gun or a cannon and there's no real in between but mm -hmm. uh, I, I look back at the campaign and i think well i don't really remember a whole lot either just kind of a lot of cutscenes, some weird sur surreal kind of visuals that happened that was kind of cool but it yeah didn't really go anywhere and that left me pretty disappointed overall i think this game is okay but just about okay uh i give this one a six you know what man i'm right there with you i had a tough time thinking about what i wanted to score this because there were aspects of this that i did enjoy but i didn't enjoy it enough throughout the course of my three hours with uh, project specter that our project catalyst sorry that it was you know a standout like we said the visuals were probably the best thing the gunplay was somewhat boring the enemy ai is really what just made this three hours actually feel a little long even just because <laughs> you're just shooting the same spongy characters over and over again so honestly man with that i gotta give it a five and a half Blacklist knew we were coming wait you think we were set up Crossfire X's single player campaign is a predictable and generic shooter. It's average in every way and unfortunately it fails to set itself apart from other similar titles. This here. So some pretty cool news coming out of LEGO this week. 
Lego's actually announced that they're going to be partnering with 2K to develop a couple of Lego sports games. We haven't got a ton of details yet, but what we do know is that they're going to be making a soccer game uh, in partnership with Sumo Digital, the developer of Sackboy. So there's definitely some promise there to come out with a, a new Lego soccer game. And we're also looking at an open world racing game from Visual Concepts, the developers of uh, NBA 2K and also WWE 2K. So this is pretty cool. I mean, we're going to be getting two new Lego sports games, uh, something that's kind of been omitted from the Lego franchise for the last little bit. I mean, Lego's kind of always had that same formula. They've made some solid games. There's been some duds mixed in there, but for the most part, their track record's pretty good. So honestly, dipping their toes and kind of getting a fresh look at the Lego world, especially the Lego sports world, I think this is a good take for them. This is a good partnership for both sides here, and I think we're going to see some pretty cool Lego games coming down the line. I don't have any more details as far as dates or anything on those games, or if they're going to be developing any games beyond these first two, but Lego Soccer and Lego Racing could be coming up pretty soon. I'm going to keep my eye out for them, and I think you should too. All right, so finally, Fallout 76 has been given a roadmap for 2022, and it's looking pretty exciting for players like myself who have been grinding this game for quite some time, or even for new players. So what's exciting is that in March, we get our first big update, and that's Invaders From Beyond. Yes, the Zaytans, the aliens have arrived and there's going to be public events that spawn all around the map where you get to take down these things, I'm guessing. I don't really know yet because it hasn't dropped, but it looks very exciting. So be ready, finish that season pass if you haven't already, you are running out of time because this new season is right around the corner. But let's get into the rest of the roadmap because this is where the true excitement begins. The summertime, we get Test Your Metal, which again brings some new public events to Appalachia, and I'm guessing some new gear perhaps. But the most exciting part is the fall. Finally, we get Expeditions introduced, and we are going to the Pit, which is one of the most exciting and beloved areas from Fallout 3 and just the Fallout universe in general. So finally, the fall we will get expeditions. I'm very curious to see what these missions entail and what exactly, what kind of gear we're going to get. And well, there's never really enough for us follow players, so in the winter time we actually get to look forward to Nuka World Tour. So that has me wondering, maybe some expeditions will take place in Nuka World? That could be pretty cool because I really enjoyed that DLC from Fallout 4. So we'll have to see what more unfolds as the year goes on. So let me know guys, are you guys playing Fallout 76? Is this going to maybe rope you in or rope you back in? Please let us know on our Discord or on our website at insidethegame.ca. Not long ago, I mentioned that Sony was releasing a new subscription service for the PlayStation, an upgrade to the PS Plus, codenamed Spartacus, to go against Xbox Game Pass. Well, this week there's been a lot of information that's been popping out on the internet regarding Spartacus, and this is what we know so far. The Spartacus subscription service will be split into three tiers. The first one will be $10, and it's called Essential and this will run the exact same features and benefits currently found on the PS Plus. The next tier is called Extra and that will cost you $13 and this will give you a game catalogue library of older downloadable games which means players will enjoy a wider range of choices and this feature might have been taken from Sony download catalogue on PS Now. And the third tier is called Premium at $16 and this will get you everything mentioned above with a lot of extra benefits. Aside from streaming tools which can help content creators, PS Plus Premium will include a library of classic games. Members will also enjoy new game trials feature. This implies a few extra hours of free gameplay on the new game releases, similar to EA Play benefits from Electronic Arts. Well, there's still not been any confirmation from Sony regarding the names of the tiers and the prices for Spartacus. But one thing is clear though, for $16 for the premium, it's still a lot more expensive than if you bought the Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. There's also been a rumour as well that Spartacus could actually be releasing in March this year. So it'll be interesting to see how it takes off against Xbox Game Pass.
With the release of Gorilla's Amazing Horizon Forbidden West, you continue your story as Aloy on a journey to the Western United States on a mission to stop a mysterious threat known as the Red Blight. So make sure you check out Drew and Marcel's review of Horizon Forbidden West on InsideTheGame.ca. But for now, I would like to give you my top 5 personal tips for Horizon Forbidden West. Tip number 1. They do a very good job on a brief recap at the beginning of Horizon Forbidden West to bring you up to speed, as this is a sequel to Horizon Zero Dawn. But if you haven't already, you must play the amazing Horizon Zero Dawn first. Zero Dawn came out in February 28, 2017 and won many awards including achievement in story. So Horizon Zero Dawn lays down the narrative foundation. Also majority of the game mechanics are similar and will help you get a better understanding of the weapon wheel, crafting and combat. Tip 2. Your focus is a very valuable tool and will help you on your mission. Once activated it will scan the nearby area to highlight wildlife for you to prey on, tracking footprints where someone has walked, finding secret chests full of loot, illuminating climbing points and ropes to help you get to your destination. But most of all scanning machines to find their weaknesses, their strengths and also find parts you can salvage. Make sure you use your focus as much as you can. Number 3 Horizon Forbidden West is not a game to be rushed, with its truly amazing backdrops in all weather conditions and a precision to detail. You want to make sure you explore this open world, as it's the best way to find hidden campfires. This will allow you to save your latest gameplay, but also fast travel to other campfires on your map without using your resources to fast travel. Number 4 Throughout the game you will come across hunting grounds and can be tested on 3 trials in allotted times. Don't give up, do these challenges. This will get you familiar with the game mechanics whether it's dodging attacks, setting traps, combos in fighting or taking down machines to gather certain parts for resources. <laughs> the savior of Meridian wins. And finally, but not least, tip number five. It's easy to bypass side missions, but don't, as this will give you more backstory to the game to keep you more immersed. But on completing these side missions will also give you rewards as resources as well as skill points, which come in very handy to build up your XP and your skill tree as you'll find that as you progress through the story you come across some machines and bosses at a higher level, which you can complete but will take you a little more effort and time in doing so. Those are my top 5 personal tips if you want the best from Horizon Forbidden West, so go now and go and get that platinum trophy. Guys, it's fair to say we've been gaming for a very long time, and over that time, there's been some games that have been cancelled. We just kind of question why, and maybe one day we'll see them. Scott, do you have a particular game that got cancelled that you'd love to see light, light the way for oh. us? Oh, I do. Um, well, Diddy Kong Racing was really <laughs> great when I was a kid. I got it on the N64, of course, and I loved it. I played hundreds of hours of that game. And it turns out there was actually supposed to be a sequel. And that was something I learned much later after the fact. But Donkey Kong Racing was supposed to come out. And what happened was Rare was purchased at the time. So instead of putting it on the Xbox, they instead just <laughs> shuttered the doors. And that was in 2002. Uh. So it doesn't look like we're getting Donkey Kong Racing. They did port Diddy Kong to the DS and the 3DS um, about a decade after that. Sure. I think that's the end of that series. 
Oh, that's, that's too bad, man. Yeah, the kart racing is a whole genre that is own. Nate, what do you have? Well, mine's a bit of a different story because yeah. I'm going to pick Doom 4. Back in the early 2010s, they showed a trailer for Doom 4, and it was oh. Doom Guy on Earth, and I just remember being like, yep, I'm totally <laughs> down. And then nothing was... We heard nothing for years. Yeah. And then finally, in 2016, we got Doom 2016, which wasn't Doom 4. It was like a... A sort of a remake of the original so in this case i think it was maybe a good call you know <laughs> that was during the time when 360 was transitioning into the sorry the xbox one era and i think you know maybe we wouldn't have had that extreme doom that we have nowadays if it was launched maybe that many years ago i'm sure. actually quite grateful for this one <laughs> but you know there are many other games i could kind of go on about that have been canceled in the past but what about you Corey? what's your pick man well you know we did a little bit of talking beforehand and we actually yeah. all kind of shared some similar <laughs> games that we uh that we kind of all wanted to see maybe come back or you know that had been canceled that we've heard nothing about but one that i landed on was from rockstar games and it was actually oh, man. teased in 2007 Rockstar a Games Agent. And this was supposed to be a 1970s Cold War era stealth kind of spy game from Rockstar Games. I mean, we know Grand Theft Auto, that doesn't really necessarily line up, right? That's not <laughs> no. two kind of play styles that you're not stealthing around that much in GTA. You're usually running and gunning more than anything. Yeah. But honestly, the game was actually teased in 2007. It was supposed to be released in 2009. There was kind of nothing going on about it. They didn't, they kind of just pushed it back, pushed it back. And then there was kind of nothing being talked about. And then in 2013, its license was renewed. And then again in 2017. And then in 2018, they kind of officially declared that the project was dead. So we're never going to see it. But honestly, this is kind of a style of game that maybe at the time wouldn't have been, you know, Rockstar's game's bread and butter. I mean, Grand Theft Auto V came out and that game was huge. It's still being played on the consoles we have now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how successful it would have been at the time. So maybe it was good that it got pushed back and maybe dead canceled altogether. But I'd be interested to see what Rockstar Games could do with a, you know, a game like that now. But it doesn't sound like we're ever gonna see it, so it's just wishful thinking more than anything. <laughs> oh man, dude, that sounded so good though back in the day. Uh, I remember getting that trailer and I was like, oh, oh, oh yes, yeah. I'm a huge stealth guy. So for me, this is all spies and stealth. I'm like, I'm in. Then you tap in with your phone and kind of keep track of all your agents. Oh, it was so sick. Yeah, rest in peace, agent. Uh yeah. <laughs> Speaking of rest in peace, Star Wars 1313 can rest oh, in peace as well, guys. Oh, That's my cho my choice. I was so excited for this project to get revealed. And it was just bounty hunter on the go kind of scenario in Star Wars setting. Like, dude, it was it fantastic looks looking. Oh, it was yeah. so good. We saw a cinematic trailer like we always do, right? Build that hype. Mm. Not only did they cancel the game, they canceled the whole studio. So that's never gonna happen anymore. <laughs> so that was a little disappointing to kind of see where that one landed. Will EA ever revitalize the Star Wars 1313 situation? I doubt it. We would be glad to see it. At the time they were like, well, the single player genre isn't really the big genre right now. It's all about multiplayer. So we don't okay. feel anybody's buying single player games. Well, now take a look. Single players yeah. everywhere, but so you know, maybe now is the time that EA takes a look back and goes, Yeah, Star Wars thirteen thirteen should get a chance and maybe we could see it hit the light of day, because I'd love to see that game, but Oh yeah. If you yeah. have a game got cancelled, but it would like to see the light of day, let us know inside the game dot CA. It's a new adventure, Pokemon Legends Arceus. Let's talk about the latest entry in the world-renowned Pokemon series. Now this one is Legends Arceus and, well, it's a breakaway from what's kind of the normal bread and butter of a Pokemon game. This one is third person instead of that top-down view and you have a lot more real-time elements to the game. I'm not fully through the game yet, so for clarity I'm about 25-30 hours in. I've seen enough that I really appreciate the differences, but well let's get into that. 
Instead of just waking up a little bit too late, as we have in the past, this has a, a whole lot of science fiction going on about the world. You are the only human to fall straight out of that hole in space-time. Nobody really knows what that means, so you face a lot of questioning and a lot of mystery as you go through the adventure, trying to figure out why are you here? Where is here? What is your mission? And how does this all link into Arceus? You're going through and you're helping these Pokemon instead of the traditional gyms. And I think I like that a lot better. I do miss the gym experience a little bit, but I found the challenges that are happening in real time and the kind of face-offs you do with these large Pokemon makes it just that much more interesting, that it's different. It's not just one to the other to the other and then you're done there's a lot of different kind of missions that come up between quests we'll call it between each of these kind of major pokemon and that gives you a lot more to do than the traditional game now there is a lot of these side quests favors or requests they call them and you can go through different towns in the, the different parts of the game pick up a lot of these side quests and that gives you a lot more to do with your time. That'll really fill out the runtime of this game. I've read online that the runtime of this game is about 40 hours, so I think that makes it significantly shorter than the average Pokemon game. But that's still a huge amount of time and a lot of things to do around this three-dimensional world. And it is a very large world. I'm not sure how it compares exactly to other Pokemon because it's not top-down. It's a little harder to quantify that way, but, well, you have a steed in this game. Instead of making yourself a little bicycle or some running shoes, you have this Pokemon that'll take you around and you end up finding different steeds that you unlock later on that have different abilities. One can sniff out certain targets, that kind of thing. Others can detect treasure under the ground. So it gives you just a little bit more to do in this big open sandbox. The absence of gyms and the, the kind of shakeup of the camera angle doesn't change the fact that there are battles. It wouldn't be a Pokemon game if there weren't. And this one has, well, a pretty intuitive way of going through the menus, just the same as the old games are. You know, you have four different attacks, your character can learn different attacks as time goes on, you evolve your Pokémon just the same as usual, but you can run around the battle kind of in 360 degrees. I'm not exactly sure why you would do that, but it is included, and I think it just kind of breaks up that menu lock kind of gameplay that we're used to. There's not a whole lot going on in terms of resolution. Um, it's not a super high, hyper-textured kind of game, but that's not really a negative because that's what I would expect from Pokemon. And I think in terms of Pokemon, the game looks quite good. As you're adventuring through these quests and collecting all these different items, these different Pokemon, well, you're very heavily encouraged to catch as many Pokemon as you can. And you're out in the wild is quite different than how you would traditionally catch Pokemon. You're running in third person, you're able to target, throw the Pokeball, there's different kind of things you can do to maximize your chances. You can bait Pokemon out with certain foods, you can throw rotten berries at them, you can hide in the grass, that way they don't even know you're there. So there's a little bit of a varied gameplay, uh, different methods there, and I think that was very good because your main mission in this game is to assemble the Pokedex. I mean, aside from what Arceus is trying to get you to do, your main mission to all these terrestrial people is they just want to learn more about the Pokemon. They're kind of, it seems like they're kind of several hundred years in the past compared to what we're used to in Johto or similar regions. So it, they have a bit of catching up to do and you become a real instrumental part in that learning. I think that's really cool because, well, everybody wants to fill out a Pokedex. Isn't that the point? 
There isn't a whole lot more I can get into without kind of digging really deep into some of the aspects and and then it becomes more of a personal matter. Do I like that certain, you know, waypoints come up and others are seemingly hidden until you're in the area? Well, that's kind of annoying. Um, having to go through an area and then return to like the main kind of schoolhouse guild hall that you're in that can get kind of annoying but there is kind of fast track ways to do that if you do a mission out with the professor he might just offer to bring you back and that saves you the transit and so they kind of go this way of smoothing out any of the potential annoyances that i would have except for there's no compass headings on the screen so it's a little curious of, uh, well, look at the map, I'm heading this way, okay, about 30 degrees off to the left is where I want to go. That's not the easiest way to navigate. If I just had a north, south, east, west, that would make it a lot easier. Pokemon Legends Arceus was very successful to me. I have played the last few Pokemon, and I played, you know, Yellow, Crystal, and Ruby back in the day, but, well, I kind of had gotten bored of it. I didn't really appreciate Pokemon in quite the same way as I used to when I was a kid, but going through this one in a new, refreshed kind of manner, well, it reminded me of that Pokemon, oh, what was it, uh, Colosseum, Pokemon XD? There was one that was on the GameCube forever ago, and it was a, another third-person kind of adventure game, and I really just got blasted back to that. That made me very excited to get into this one, and then, you know, one or two hours in, all right, it's hooked me. I need to get my dream team of Pokemon. I need Scyther, I need Fomantis, I need Caesar, I need Kabutops, all these Pokemon kind of come together and I, I have a real goal to myself, not the video game that's making me do it. I had a real good time with this one. They went and changed up the, the formula, the tried and true formula. They took some risks here and there, but I think overall it really paid off. I'm looking forward to the next Pokemon Legends game, and this one gets an 8 out of 10 for me. Just about as good, I think, as Pokemon can get. A welcome departure from the Pokemon formula. An excellent title for longtime returning fans. In Fallout 76, there are quite often weekly and daily challenges for hunting down legendary enemies. And even outside of that, it's really exciting to find a 1-3 to three star legendary and hope to get that legendary piece of gear that you've been working for. So in this video, I'm going to teach you guys how to hunt down legendaries most efficiently and where to do it exactly. There are a ton of events in this game that you might not even know that spawn legendaries and spawn a ton of them. So without listing all of the events that spawn legendaries, I'm just going to list a few of them. Distant Thunder is a good one because it spawns constant Scorch Beasts and quite often they are legendaries. Radiation Rumble spawns many legendaries throughout the entire time limit, so whether you're defending either side, you are guaranteed to get a few legendaries throughout this event. Scorched Earth of course has the Scorched Queen, but alongside that there are many legendaries that often spawn throughout the span of the event. And lastly, Uranium Fever. There are a pile of Mole Miner legendaries that spawn in throughout this event, and quite often people are generous in letting you actually get your hands on killing it, so you actually are getting that legendary kill. And if you're at the point in the story where you're ready to launch a nuke, if you go and complete any of the silos, there is a guaranteed 3-star legendary that spawns in throughout the silo. So now you're asking yourself, what do I do? There's no events that are spawned in that have any legendaries. Well, your best bet is to go and hunt down each of those fisher sites scattered throughout Appalachia. There is almost a guaranteed legendary at each of these. The Scorch Beasts quite often are a one to a three star legendary, and there are many scattered throughout Appalachia. So your best bet is to go clear these areas, and then again, look at the map, because before you know it, there will be another event that spawns in the legendary.
All right, Steve, away we go. It's time to hit the racetrack. Steve, we have the latest Gran Turismo 7 on our PlayStation 5s right now, and we're hitting the racetrack once again in a much slower simulated pace. What are your <laughs> thoughts on this one, my friend? Well, first off, I've never played any Gran Turismo games at all. Sure. So get, jumping into a racing game, I've played a bit of Forza, Need for Speed, that kind of thing. And they've really slowed this down. <laughs> but it's... <laughs> uh, yep. Yes, you do the tracks, but there is there is quite a lot to do in this if, if you're ready to do the grind for it. Because sure. this game is definitely a grind. And like you said, you start off, you, you do a couple of courses, and then you go straight to a cafe, which I believe is a new uh, feature to this game. Yeah. And the idea is you meet Luca, and the idea is it gives you a menu. And the idea is, depending on the type of class, you have to collect three class, three different cars yep. by racing, and then you unlock the car, and then it gives you an update, a brief description about the history of that car. <sighs> Yeah, it's it's well endowed in the world of, you know, history and, and where cars yeah. came from and all that stuff. It's very sim heavy, it, but it's almost it's at this point, Steve, Gran Turismo is stuck in the past. Gran Turismo 7 is way back where it needs to get caught up to the future because everything nowadays is it's got your heart pumping, right? Not once did my heart pound in this game. It kind of I think it actually slowed down. I don't even think I listened to the audio. I actually turned it off and put a podcast on because there's nothing to listen to. There's no yeah. voice acting, right? You talk to Luca, you talk to all these other people who help you through the game. Not once is there any voice acting. Like, there's no text. voiceover. It's all text. I'm like, are you kidding? You've got to be kidding me, right? So you lose already that bit of a connection there, trying to build some kind of momentum and some hype getting into this game and then you start off with some of the slowest cars in the world right and then the tracks are the same thing steve at yep. one point i had to turn off all of the assists just so i could maybe hit a wall like it was just so this game is so dull it is so boring i fell asleep playing this game man and i know i'm yeah. not the biggest racing sim fan i'm definitely more on the world of you know an arcade racer but they need to catch up with everybody else because there's just no excitement in this game we got grid legends that just dropped it came with a story like you talk yeah. to you go into dirt and that's a sim racing too horizon motorsport dude there's a lot more life into these games than where we're at with gran turismo 7 i definitely feel that this is for somebody it's definitely yeah. not for us and it's just to me dude like that's what i said i think my heart kind of slowed down a bit and i fell asleep playing the game it is so dull and this oh, elevator what? music steve there's elevator music in this game <laughs> no, like, no. Like, like you can't get into it and get your heart right i'm like all right let's get into this race yeah i, I mean to be honest with you i mean i was very more disappointed actually on the gameplay itself because it looked like they held, they held back the performance of the ps5 but yeah. what it can do it felt very basic i actually compared it to gt6 after we talked a little bit yeah and there wasn't a lot of difference especially from the top down of the vehicle sure i think i even saw grass that looked like a copy and paste that looked like it's standing out by itself and just moves and because <laughs> i saved it all for the replay all the best performance but yeah. after playing for like doing a couple of laps on to do it and then actually sitting there watching the replay in high performance with the music that was annoying in the background yeah i kept skipping that part it, it, that bit didn't do much for me. I wish the game actual play was better graphical, graphically. Absolutely. And it is just, dude, when you're racing, you can't even change the music. So if you don't like the song, you're stuck with it regardless. And it's just like, man, like so many quality of life things within the game that yeah. are that it's been resolved by so many other games before it, right? And that's what I mean. This game is so stuck in the past. It's just a dull yeah. experience to play. The licensing thing is still a thing. You know, you got to go from checkpoint A, checkpoint B in a straight line and then stop in that square. Okay, great. Now yeah. we're going to give you a faster car and you got to do it again. I'm like, oh my goodness, really? This is what we're going to do? Okay, now you're going to curve a corner. Well, now here's a faster car. Now curve the corner again. I'm like, oh man. Like, I yeah, just, it, I, dude, I just don't want to do it. The cafe is there. The characters are boring. Everything about this game is just boring. 
Yeah. I mean, it sounds to me when I read up about it, they they listened to the, the actual people that played it and brought back stuff that they loved about this game. And they wanted to make this for new beginners as well. So I can see that the history of cars, but if sure. you're not that way inclined, you know, if you don't love your top gears and your F1 yeah. or your indie racing, then it's not going to hit the mark for everyone. But no. one thing I do want to quickly touch on, how did you find the dual sense with the, the new rumbles and the different features? I love the feedback, game? man. That dual sense controller takes every yeah. game to that next level, right? It even helped here with Gran Turismo 7. You get that feedback, the haptic feedback in the triggers and, and stuff. Dude, they have the speaker there too on the controller. Not utilized whatsoever in this game. It counts yeah. down doo, 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 through the speaker and that's it. I'm like, okay, I know we should probably play with headphones. But the, hey, again, that's why I said I, the only reason I had headphones on is so I could listen to my podcast. Yeah, I, I had the headphones on. It, it sounded reasonably decent. I wish there was more commentary or something like some oh. other games, just to yeah. make it, just to really to immerse you in that experience. But to be honest with you, you will be doing a lot of hours just to grind to unlock all those 400 plus cars. Yeah. And then you could slightly tweak them. But all they've done is just taken from the other six games and just made the seventh one and just added. The cafe to it. Well, Steve, I think we're done with Gran Turismo 7. I know I am. What do you score in this one? Uh, this game is not for everyone. I did enjoy the experience I had. I probably won't pull the grind in to unlock all the cars and everything like that. I was a little bit disappointed on some of the graphic graphics when actually playing the game. Yeah. But overall, it was fun and it's say, not for everyone, but. I'm giving this an 8 out of 10. I think you're definitely way too high. Definitely too high for me. This game was boring from the get-go. Even with that long intro, you couldn't even skip. This thing was like four minutes long. And I was like, wow. Even that started with the elevator music. And that kind of set the whole tone of the game for me moving forward. Unfortunately for me, I'm there with a 5.5. There's lots here to collect and grind for that car enthusiast fans will enjoy. However, Gran Turismo 7 feels stuck in the past with boring music, no voiceovers, and the return of old gameplay mechanics that don't match some of the other sim racing games of today. That'll wrap up today's episode. Thank you for hanging out with us. And as always, you can be a part of our show by going to insidethegame.ca or hit us up in Discord. We're there. You can spend your clip and be the highlight of the week. This week, we have our very own Parker50 hanging out with some buddies in Rogue Company. This is what gaming's all about. Until next week, thanks for hanging out with us, and we'll see you inside the game. Thank you. You're good, Paul. Get up, baby! Hey, <laughs> yeah, he's hurt. Just as hurt as you. Yeah, Shit! buddy. We're one coming, one coming, one coming! Here she comes! Yep. She's up top! Up top. Ah! One shot, one shot! Oh. One shot! Oh, enemies are yeah. Ah. <laughs>